What's going on YouTube? It's Pete coming in hot with another video, also known as that guy Pete. You just refuse to invite to gatherings. Mm. And as you can see, we have shifted things around yet again. I have ordered a desk to replace this kitchen table behind me because if you don't get invited to gatherings, what the hell do you need a table with chairs for, right? <laughs> no, on a serious note, uh, I think it just makes sense to have an L-shaped desk in this corner, have my work computers on one part of the L, and then have this new computer that I just got, an iMac. Um, it's the 2017 one worth the upgradable RAM. I just thought it made sense to get that. Have that on the other. Um, took some getting used to because I'm a PC user. Um, in particular, I have a gaming PC, HP Omen Obelisk, that I use. Um, but this is kind of something, you know, different for me. So I had to learn the ropes on how to install the Logitech Brio, how to install the Blue Yeti mic and all that. But, um, yeah, that, that was, um, something I had to get done before I started recording and I had to figure out how to sync everything. Um, so tax season's finally over. So made it through that. And, um, I did pop a cherry yesterday. The cherry that I popped was the Pew Pew America <laughs> cherry. So uh, my first time, I went out to Long Island because over there you're allowed to own firearms and shit like that. You're not allowed to do that in the five boroughs, obviously. <laughs> but um, I decided um, to go out there uh, and just you know give that a whirl. So I tried the, uh, the AR, the AK, uh, a couple of shotties. And uh, I got to tell you, at first when you go in, it, um, it's a little unnerving, but then once you kind of figure it out, someone walks you through it. This is how you deal with the slide, the magazine, the safety, and all that. It was actually actually a lot of fun. Had a good time. Uh, it's def definitely some some masculine ooga booga came out of me. <laughs> Felt good. Felt good. So yeah, that that's where I was yesterday, which is why I didn't make a video yesterday. But today, what we are here to do is we are here to do Q and A. Once a month, we do Q&A on this channel. And I asked you earlier this week to leave your questions. And you did not disappoint. Um, as always in advance, um, I may not know the answers to everything. Or I may not necessarily have an opinion on everything due to my ignorance on the matter. So if I do not give you a satisfactory answer, I do apologize in advance. Though I will try my absolute best to answer the questions or give my honest opinion. We're going to go through these in the order that they were um, posted. So I'm just going to sort by newest first. We're going to do it pretty much the same exact way we did it last time. I read out the questions. I give you my honest take. Um, and then that's pretty much it. And if you want to discuss your questions further... Or if you have other questions that you just want to ask in the comments just to keep the conversation going. If I don't have an answer, someone in this space surely will. And that's why we're all in this together. Okay? So, without further ado, let's just go ahead and go through the questions together. So, um, the first thing that was posted <laughs> was by, uh, looks like a Maurice Levy. Um, the aftermath hashtag fix that for you. I think he was joking about um, how the aftermath of tax season, uh, basically after all the math of doing the tax returns is done. So, haha, <laughs> very funny. But the first actual question we have here is from Proud American seventeen seventy six. Woohoo, America! How very fitting, given where I was yesterday, exercising my rights as an American. <laughs> Do you think the percentage of incels will increase in the future? And if so, will it lead to social unrest or something like that? So to answer the first question, do I think we are seeing an increase in men who want to get laid, but have been collectively rejected despite their best efforts? Um, I would say uh, yes. Incels are definitely on the rise. Um, that being said, is there also a rise of vol cells who claim in seldom but are not true in cells? 
um, I would certainly say that is also yes. So when looking at it like that, um, it's abundantly clear to me that um, in seldom and vol seldom are both on the rise. That much is clear from where I sit. Now, the question, of course, would be, all right, do we have more of an increase in in seldom or more of an increase in vol seldom? I definitely would say it's the latter for sure. I think we have a lot of people out there where, you know, the common critique that the red pill and the black pill get is, you know, well, you don't even put yourself out there. You don't even try um, and you don't even work on self-improvement in any capacity. And I certainly think that that is true for many. Absolutely. Um, but be that as it may, I also think that there are people, it doesn't really matter how much they try, um, the words, there is no gym for your face, does ring true for them. But I do think we definitely have a larger increase of vol cells instead of incels. So when you follow up that question, do you think it'll lead to social unrest? No, I don't think so. Not in the short term, at least. But in the long term, I suppose if the problem gets bad enough, anything is possible. So hopefully that answers your question. Moving on to the second question. This is from Van Lee. So being an accountant, I'm sure you come across a lot of different professions and career fields. If you were to aggregate everything, which professions make the most bank and which professions most correlate with sub fives, normies, and chads? So here's the thing. I work virtually, which means I don't really get to see the physical appearance of people. So I couldn't really tell you with sub fives, normies, and chads. Um, that being said, um, which professions make the most bank? From what I've seen, people who work in STEM make the most bank. Um, I would wager that a lot of sub fives do work in STEM. Yeah. Um, while I guess normies and chads, normies are probably just doing jobs like what I do. And chads, you know, they're probably doing, you know, acting, athletes, you know, all the high status jobs because, again, Matthew effect. Now, like I said, STEM is probably the most, in particular, technology, IT. So the biggest W-2s that I see tend to be from Meta Systems, formerly Facebook, Apple, Google, the big tech firms. They tend to pay out the most if you're looking for a W-2. Now, if you're talking about self-employed income, here's the thing. You either have a good product or you have knowledge that is worth charging to impart consulting. So I would say most people in the self-employed arena there is consulting is probably the main way people make money uh, but in terms of selling products e-commerce is probably how um, you know most would make money if they're selling products and they probably have a drop shipping type arrangement next question is from mog be mogged it says thoughts on the insect model to which I replied, we'll need clarification on what exactly this is. I still don't know what this is. So if any of you can clarify what it is in the comments, I will answer that there, okay? So sorry, Mog be mogged. I don't know what the insect model is, so I can't answer that question, okay? The next one is from Blue Ocean Sky. Okay, well, my question is, does promiscuity negatively affect society as a whole? If so, what are those effects, and how does it affect the social threshold of society? So, does promiscuity negatively affect society? Well, at the end of the day, not everyone is promiscuous, and probably it's a minority of people that are notably promiscuous in this society. In fact, more people are not having sex now than ever. They're too focused on themselves. No doubt a function of the internet, social media, and so on. It just kind of gets you living in this hermetic bubble, so to speak. I would say, though, that promiscuity can have a negative impact on individuals. I do think 
that promiscuity has a more pronounced negative effect on women than it does on men because sex has more of an emotional meaning to women than it does to men. Um, but that doesn't mean that lots and lots of casual sex can't have a negative psychological impact on men. I certainly do believe it can, but I think the threshold is much, much higher for it to have a negative impact on men. I have seen videos of former male porn stars that have been with thousands of women, and you could tell there's some screws loose, that um, there's some damage that was done from doing that long term. But again, it takes a lot more for it to impact a man versus a woman. And I think that's just uh, evolutionary biology, right? But does promiscuity affect society as a whole? Well, I think it makes raising kids more difficult. So I guess it would affect it in that regard because any, any daughter can just go on Instagram and see a bunch of thoughts and now they want to aspire to be that. So that's negative. Um, I think honestly when it comes to teaching about sexuality, there should be an age um, you know, cap on that. I think um, you know a lot of the left is taking what the Florida governor is doing. They're twisting it. They're you know changing the narrative to make it sound like he's homophobic. When it's like, look, bro, no, we could talk about that kind of shit. But it's like, bro, there's like an age where you talk about that. And I would say probably the absolute earliest. Like if we're gonna make this, this is including exceptions. I would say late middle school, like eighth grade probably the absolute earliest but ideally high school is probably when you want to teach kids about this stuff because that's like when puberty hits and they're transitioning into a teenager hormones are riding high trying to make sense of where they fit in this whole sexual hierarchy and all that um yeah but the point is with an overly sexualized society which by extension results in an overly promiscuous society um i think it does cause long-term damage because um, kids lack discipline because there's no dads in the house. But it's definitely more an individual by individual thing in the grand scheme of things. You have to worry about how it affects you and what you're going to do. Promiscuity, obviously, is becoming more in your face. It's not empowering. It's um, it's degrading, to be honest. But um, at the end of the day, of course, I think it has negative implications on society. But at the end of the day, you have to worry about how it affects you. You can't spend your time trying to save the world because, to be honest, the world doesn't want to be saved. So hopefully that answers your question, Blue Ocean Sky. Next is aplexity. What worked for you to study for the CPA exam? I'm about to start studying for the exam, and I'm willing to look to find what will help me. Well, first off, um, good. CPA is definitely one of those things uh, you do get a lot of respect um, as a CPA. So, you know, I respect you for pursuing that. How I prepared for the CPA exam. So, first thing is you have to get a review course. I just think it's a, it's like a, it's like a, it's like a diet. It's a workout regimen. It's just good to have a CPA course. Now, it depends on what type of teaching style you like. For example, me. I like teachers who are energetic when they teach. If you don't give a fuck about what you're teaching, why should I give a fuck? That's kind of my attitude towards it. To that end, um, I am a fan of Roger CPA Review. So if you want to just kind of go on YouTube, see a few samples of his lectures, again, he has this energy about him. And you, you may have your reservations about that, but he knows his stuff. He's very good at what he does, and it helped me. What he offers is four textbooks for audit, regulation, um, business environment concepts, and financial accounting and reporting. Okay, And he also has like an actual online course where you watch the lectures, you answer the questions, you can do practice exams, um, and you know it's multiple choice and task-based simulations. And um, there is also a cram course if you want that. It's like a shorthand version. Like after you do the main course, if you just want to like refresh your mind real quick, just go through the cram. You also can get an audio course. I don't know if he still has that, but if it does, it's basically an audio version of the cram course. I used to listen to that while I was working out in the gym. That was my soundtrack <laughs> for a year of my life. 
but you have to study every single day. You have to uh, do the lectures. You have to commit to it. But what personally worked for me, watch the lectures. When I'm done with the section, fuck around with the questions a little bit. Feel like you got a good grip on it. Then do the next lectures and just keep going through that. And then probably two weeks before your exam, you're just doing one practice exam a day. Every single day, you're just doing a practice exam. And then when you walk in, you just take it. And that's it. You start really building momentum when you start passing. I recommend doing FAR first. FAR is no, definitely the biggest um, piece of the curriculum. It's the core of accounting. Um, generally accepted accounting principles and international financial reporting standards. Though they don't really cover IFRS as much as GAAP, but that's changing because there's an expectation that as a professional, you should at least be somewhat aware of what you know, bookkeeping and how all that works, you know, on foreign shores, because most conform to IFRS. You know, America, we're stubborn. We have gap. We have our way. Uh, the UK, I think, has its own gap as well. There's a few other holdouts, but for the most part, part IFRS is becoming the new standard. But um, at the end of the day, after you take that, I would say probably take the part that you're more inclined to be good at. So if you're more inclined to be tax, do tax first. If you're more inclined to be audit, do audit next. Um, and then after you get that out, then do BEC. That's a softball. Just knock it out. And then you have either reg or audit last. And that's pretty much what I would recommend you do for that. Obviously, on the college front, be sure you have your 150 credits. Um, and then depending on where you're at. If you're in New York like me, you have to work under a CPA for a year and then they sign off on the paperwork. You get the John Hancock, you send it over to the uh, the um, the Office of Professions and then they send you your certificate and that's it. So obviously it's not that simple, but once you get those credentials and you see your name on that and you have a license number and everything, you're going to feel really good about yourself. Like, yeah, like you really accomplished something big. So I wish you all the best. And I hope that your um, studying goes well. As I said, Roger CPA review. Check it out. It's, it's pretty good. All right. So next we got Keith. Okay. Try breaking out of your comfort zone and address the issue of passion. Namely, the passion a man has for life that is very individual. Mm -hmm. Even an identifying characteristic. And that may be the key to his survival and to beginning a career that will make his fortune and make him happy. True. If you love what you do, uh, you're more likely to work hard at it. Matthew effect, when you work hard, you get positive results. That reinforces you and motivates you further. You do more and more and more and more. Passion is very important. I'm not saying you have to be in love with what you do, but you at least have to like what you do. That's for sure. All right. And then he asked a three-part question. So he says, how does he identify his passion? Or how does he come to realize he hasn't any passion? The only way to identify your passion is trial and error, in my opinion. Just try things until something works. There is no carnation instant. This is what you're good at. This is what you're going to love. You have to try things. Because if you don't try things, you're not going to know if you like it or not. And, uh, you know, George Carlin, he did a joke. He said, like, yo, I don't have to try broccoli. I could just look at that and go, oh, I don't like that. <laughs> But the truth is, um, when it comes to what you're going to be doing with a third of your life for the better part of you know 25 plus years, um, I think you owe it to yourself to at least explore your options and try things. And now in the age of the internet, where you have access to all this information and you can kind of see what things entail, and you can gather that information very quickly, um, I would say it's um, a lot easier to identify what resonates with you than it has ever been. Probably in the old days, I would say, go to a library and start reading up on topics until something hits. It's like, wow, this is what I really like. But um, yeah, I would say nowadays you're just trying things, right? That, that's kind of how you identify the passion, I would say. If he has no passion, what does he do next? So this is the tough question, right? If you, if you can't find something or you spend a lot of time um, looking for something, well, what do you do next? This is a difficult question for me to answer um, because I ultimately found what I was good at and what I cared about, and that was taxation. That, that's what I wanted to work in. 
But I did have 10 years or so of life where I was just working in a pharmacy, drinking my life away, and felt like my life was going nowhere. And yet I still got out of bed every day. And I think that's because there, there was hope. And hope is a powerful thing that can keep you going, but false hope is something that can guide you in incorrect directions. So well-placed hope is very, very important. But um, I would say never give up the search on passion. But if he truly believes that he cannot find a passion, then I guess the next best thing is find something that you're good at. Because when a man is working, he is accomplishing something. He is, he is achieving something. And achieving something will create a positive feedback loop. Like, I'll be honest with you, I don't like everything there is about being a CPA. I don't like everything about it. Um, I wouldn't say that, you know, being a CPA is something that I'm so passionate about that it would have been like the ideal, you know. But I think at the end of the day, um, having something to show for it, I think is, is important regardless of whether you're passionate about it or not. I think honestly, most people don't even like what they do or bare minimum. They don't love what they do. They're okay with what they do. They're managing what they do. So if you have no passion, I guess the next best thing would be to find what you're good at and dedicate your life to what you're good at and, um, uh, leaving your mark in that regard. Now, if that is not satisfactory, for you, um, then to be honest, I wouldn't know what to tell you. Like if I just said, well, just find something you're good at. And then you tell me like, well, I don't want to do that. Then I would just be like, okay, well, what do you want to do? And then they probably have an idea of what they want to do. And it's like, all right, then just do that. Then the third question is if he has a passion, how does he fortify himself against the world that will try to tear him down and neutralize him? Yeah, so I have a concept I always talk about, stoic indifference. This idea of essentially just um, maintaining composure, not losing my cool, and um, ultimately just not giving a fuck. I really try to walk around in life with full transparency. Pretty much my entire existence is on display. And um, there is something liberating about that because here's the thing. People might try to tear you down, but what if the things that they think are going to cripple you don't cripple you because you don't give a fuck like well what happens then what if you're the kind of person that that can't be blackmailed you're not the kind of person that can be taken down a few pegs because you own the pegs you own them so i would say you really have to internalize the idea that if if people know things about you and the things about you aren't exactly flattering your reaction to that basically has to just be and which is difficult because again men don't really care about social approval disapproval as much as women do it doesn't mean we don't care about it though we do we want to be approved of by our peers but the less of a fuck you give the easier it is to not really be concerned with people trying to tear you down and neutralize you you just sort of accept that comes with the territory in life there's always going to be people who don't like you and that's pretty much it but yeah the process of neutralizing and tearing you down is is enveloped in psychological chess so the best way to be good at psychological chess is to not make moves recklessly based on the opinions of other people and if you're not sure of the answers then please 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 just admit as much so i would say um the answers I gave you probably aren't as satisfactory as you were hoping for. So I guess to the extent that my answers were not satisfactory, I can admit that I don't know the information that's going to fill in that gap um, that is not satisfactory. So I can admit that much. But I hope that the information I did impart onto you was worth something in your eyes. And that's all I have to say, Keith. So thank you for your question. Next, Nancy Pelosi. <laughs> if you had to 100% buy into and live your romantic life according to the blue, red, or black, which pill would you choose? Please elaborate on why. 
Well, here's the thing. I'm a normie, right? Which means acknowledging black pill is optional, right? But I, I, I'm black pill aware. I, I know about black pill. I know about the importance of looks. I understand there's a basic looks test. And if you fail that looks test and you do nothing to really address that, your life's going to be hell. I acknowledge that. At least in the dating world, it's going to be hell. I mean, a sub five can go work in STEM and make $700,000 a year, including restricted stock options and things like this. But again, dick is dry. Now, that being said, I wouldn't want to live in a blue pill world because, again, all you're going to find is just reality not matching up to the expectations instilled in you by ideals. So blue pill is not an option. So, I mean, if I had to pick like, hey, which fact pattern would you be okay with knowing and not knowing anything else? Red pill probably would be the ideal for me because, again, I'm a normie which means all I have to do is make course corrections on the psychological front. I don't really have to do much on the physical front. I gotta go to the gym, lift some weights, get get this sort of muscle stacked on top of this frame a little bit. That's about all I really have to do. I'm 6'4", my face is mm, average to slightly below average, so it's like, okay. Yeah, you know, I've been spraying some fucking um, <laughs> Rogaine and Propecia on my head, and honestly, my hairline's been coming back, so that feels good. Um, I've been using, you know, um, tretinoin, niacinamide, and azelaic acid. It's a combination anti-aging cream. That's been helping me look more youthful. So, you know, I'm doing the maintenance. But here's the thing. As a normie, I can afford that. And, like, it'll make a difference. But if you're a sub-5, it won't. So I always say this. If you're a normie, red pill is probably for you. If you're a sub-5, you kind of have to acknowledge the black pill. But ultimately, the goal is to achieve some sort of white pill type situation where you've accepted it right? I always say that red and black is just the information, right? It's just the information. It's nothing else. So how you react to it, that's kind of what happens after the now what. Some people get stuck in rage and they never get out of it. Some people get stuck in that nihilistic valley. We try to pull you out, but not everyone does. And this is where the idea that black pill equals nihilism comes from. Black pill is just the information. Height matters, looks matters. These things matter. Nihilism is the reaction to black pill. Right? Well, okay. Now you know the information. Now what? It's over? That's your reaction? Nihilism? Fatalism? That type of thing? But the information in and of itself is not nihilistic. It's just facts. So I would say ultimately the goal is to kind of have this white pill um, acceptance of everything answer the question now what and find your purpose in the world of your own accord so a man who's rp aware that ultimately decides MGTOW and lives by that philosophy i would consider that guy white pill he's accepted things for what it is and he's just he's just living his life but if you're saying hey which which part of information do i think is relevant to me personally red pill so hopefully that answers your question nancy next we have eric what up eric From my observation, it seems that mental health has become a big topic, and both men and women are experiencing a decline in that area. Yes. Do you think it's a result of increased diagnosing? Yeah. Actual increase in mental health problems? Also, yeah. Or are modern people merely too sensitive making mountains out of molehills? Also, yeah. As men, what would you recommend we do to stay on top of our problems? Mmm very very good questions these are the kind of questions that's like hey this could help people so yes thank you for asking eric so short answer is this okay i always say this right with social media and the internet we have never been more connected as people yet um disconnected at the same time distanced from one another as humans human interaction is becoming a dying art technology is substituting for everything Women get their digital supermen on the internet. Men get their sexual needs met through pornography. So, obviously, when you are not getting true human connection in the intimate sense, you have no intimacy with the opposite sex. You have no passion with the opposite sex and certainly no commitment with the opposite sex. What happens, essentially, is that yeah, there's going to be degradation in mental health, which leads to a lot of this lashing out that we are seeing everywhere in all arenas. 
So I would say that, obviously, in the field of psychology, we have gotten much, much better at diagnosing mental illness, addressing mental illness, and treating it. But the fact that therapy as a business is booming in the first place is indeed problematic. But there is definitely an actual increase in mental health problems because humans were built to socialize and substituting that for technology is going to have long-term impacts. And also taking a very casual approach to sex and relationships in general when they're meant to be more serious is also going to cause problems. But I also do think that definitely people are fucking pussies. Yes. But I would recommend dealing with mental health. Again, I've talked about this in the white pill playlist. A lot of men don't want to go to therapy. And that's fine. You don't have to. But I think you should if you have a recurring problem that you cannot address on your own. Your mental health is very important. And um, you go to therapy, what you discuss in that room, it's your business. You don't have to talk to anybody else about it if you don't want to. But I generally recommend to men to talk to a male therapist. Um, Does that mean a female therapist isn't productive? Not necessarily, but I just think on a balance of probabilities, most men will do better with a male therapist. Um, And if it truly is a medical problem where no matter what you do, you're it's just it's just chemicals again some of my subscribers believe that you know chemicals is a crock of shit and some believe that no there's merit to it doesn't hurt to try and if it doesn't work just stop taking it but there are medications that can be used um, that could take the edge off if needed but the point is if you really feel you have a psychological health issue going to a shrink is not the worst decision that you can make um and i've had some subscribers concerns like said yo if i talk about the fucked up things that go on in my head they throw me in a psych ward that's like okay fair enough um you have so very much like any other relationship in life you have to manage your relationship with your therapist um carefully you have to maybe gradually ease into it not dump everything on their lap on day one you know and um you know eventually you have those moments with them and and they help you piece by piece But it can be a little overwhelming when you throw everything at them at once, you know? So, yeah. Hope that answers your question, Eric. Next is Sean Khan. How are you? Did you survive the tax season? I'm here. (laughs) I'm doing good. I'm doing good, man. Thanks for asking. Joker bro, do you really think your life will become more fulfilling after you get into a serious relationship? Well, that depends. Why are you trying to get the relationship? Are you trying to get the relationship because you believe having a serious LTR with a woman is going to somehow just carnation instant make your life better just because you're in a relationship? Because I would say that being in a serious relationship in and of itself is not going to just make your life better. No. If you're in a relationship with the wrong woman, it's going to make your life worse than it is when you're alone. That's where that saying, I feel more alone when I'm with you than I am when I'm by myself comes from. But the idea that, hey, if I'm in a relationship with the right woman, I pass all her flags, she passes all my flags, or, or enough that we can you know, be together and be okay with it, then I would say um, it could, yes. A relationship is supposed to enhance your life, not detract from it. So if a relationship with the woman in question is a good relationship, you know, you know, she takes care of herself physically, I take care of myself physically, you know, she brings that feminine energy, I bring that masculine energy, you know, I'm relatively modest, sexually speaking, so I would hope she's relatively modest, sexually speaking as well, doesn't have a past like Kim Kardashian or some shit, Um, and you know, just neurologically, we're compatible and things like this then yeah, I suppose we could enhance one another's lives and we'll be better together than we would be apart. But in 2022, I don't think that's something you should count on. So the short answer is no, a relationship in and of itself will not make your life more fulfilling. But a relationship with the right woman can make your life more fulfilling. But the odds of that happening compared to how it was, say, my parents' generation or generations before that, um, the odds definitely have not tipped in our favor as men. So take that for what you will. Next, Ariel's portal. 
Kind of a different question, but I was thinking about how women get very attracted to men that can sing, dance, or play guitar. Mm -hmm. I wonder if there is, or you have any kind of explanation for why women are so attracted to men with some specific musical abilities, even when they are feminine by the eyes of other men. Maybe it's a cheat code if done right to inspire genuine desire on women. So here's the thing. With the whole masculine feminine thing, there's what's called oofy doofy theory. The idea that um, we're being socially conditioned to do a gender role reversal here. So over time, women are going to probably be more, more attracted to the K-pop stars and that type of shit because the hive mind says so. What the hive mind says goes. But the hive mind in and of itself is an ooga booga characteristic of how the female brain works. So I guess we can kind of put the feminine shit to the side. The fact that other men think that the guy is feminine, I don't think that matters. I think women care more what other women think than what men think because men are just human doings to women, so they don't really care what men think. They care what their fellow women think about whether or not the guy she picked is a good pick. So if all the women around her say the K-pop star is what should be getting you aroused, then for all intents and purposes, that should be what does it. So just put that out of the way. But generally, when it comes to you know musical talent and things like this, again, it communicates ambition. It communicates um, initiative. It communicates um, you know that a willingness to self improve and become a more valuable man. So obviously, men who do things like that are going to be more attractive to women. But more importantly, musicians also tend to be pre-selected. Women like musicians, and women care what other women think. So if the hive mind says that musicians are sexy, then the average woman is probably going to think that as well. Okay? Just think about that uh, that Latino man with the ponytail, the rose in his mouth who plays guitar. Like, yeah. So I would say um, it's not so much that you're playing music that makes you more attractive. It's that that particular thing is pre-selected. And... Um, that that's what makes it attractive but of course most people aren't musically talented so it's, it's another thing that sets you apart which increases your status and women do value high status don't forget that so that's probably the best explanation i can give on that so hopefully that answers your question ariel's portal next the dude what's up dude your personal all-time favorite books movies top five maybe top three but if you don't have any at the moment, are there any books, movies that you would really like to read, watch in coming months, years? Thank you for all your hard work, Pete, and the value you give in your videos. You're welcome, dude. So, books, I mean, I'm not as much of a reader as I should be. That being said, movies. Let's think about movies. I've always been a fan of The Matrix. Um, in particular, the original Matrix film. I like that film a lot. I am a John Wick fan. I do like the Watchmen movie. That kind of got like average reviews, but I'm just, I'm a fan of Watchmen in general. I just really like Watchmen. So definitely that's a, a movie I like. Mm, I am a fan of uh, Nemo Nobody. I think it's called Nemo Nobody. I like that movie. That's a good movie. Goodwill Hunting, that's a good movie. I mean, you gotta respect The Godfather, that's a good movie. The second one in particular, I really liked. Um, what else? What else? What else? What else? What else? What else? Mm. I mean, that's all that comes to mind immediately. So I guess if, if I had to pick the number one, I would say it's probably Matrix. I mean, books, most books that I read are just based on video games. So I've, I've read a lot of Mass Effect books and Halo books, primarily. I got some Gears of War books in the backlog that I probably have to read. But, um, yeah, I, th I think that's all I've got, man. So hopefully that answer was satisfactory for you. Next we have Malikant. Do you think that VR and AI technology will advance to the point where it will be able to provide men with at least a reason fast male of a human female... Uh, facsimile. I fucking said that wrong. Oh, idiot. <laughs> of a human female. If it does, what do you think will be the result? Personally, I think men would gain far more from a fake partner than women. If the fake partner in question can emulate a real woman flawlessly, 
I agree. And I've talked about this in the um, the technology video, like dolls and stuff like that. Um, I've got some subs who have shared their experiences on that, and you know they they say it, it works really well for them. I know Turk Flinging Monkey is a huge proponent of that. Um, but again, until it's like Detroit become human, I don't think it's going to be an adequate substitute. Mm -hmm. The human brain can be tricked, but there are limitations to how effectively it can be tricked, if that makes any sense. So I would say until the VR and AI technology reaches that level where it can pretty much flawlessly emulate the real thing in some capacity, um, it will not be able um, it will not be able to provide men with the adequate substitute for because I think a lot of it is like, look, we already have a substitute for the sexual aspect, that's pornography, but we that does not fill the emotional void of not having a companion. So that's that's the meat that we have to be able to substitute for. And ladies that are watching, if you see men asking questions like this um, and you're a single woman looking for a man, this should give you pause for concern that men are looking at modern women and thinking, something ain't right here, we need to find alternatives. This is not an avenue that you want to see men going down en masse. It will cause problems for you as well. So if you're thinking, hey, maybe we should be meeting these guys halfway, um, you should start entertaining ways to do that for sure. So hopefully that answers your question, Malakant. Next is Fit Fingers, the Lord of Iron, if I am not mistaken. Since we seem to have a crisis of motivation, meaning, purpose, etc., do you think there is any practical means of acquiring the necessary amount of ambition in order to pursue life goals? Or do you think it is more of a phenomenon that needs to hit someone like a ton of bricks in order to motivate them to better their lives, like a hard lesson? Example, for context, someone who doesn't care for firearms or fitness survives a robbery, home invasion, or attempted homicide, therefore is pushed to buy firearms and train with them, as well as getting fit for the next ground and pound or anything else which in the long run promotes a healthy physical lifestyle. A final note, let us all bow before Stardust, the sleepless simian, the true king of the phallic ones. <laughs> so, question is, is the motivation that we seem to have a crisis of acquiring, is it something that you just go out and find? I mean, it could be, but I definitely think for an overwhelming majority of people, it's the second thing. A sack of bricks just has to crack you upside the head. That's how I quit alcohol. You just kind of have to really take a long look at your life, and then you have that epiphany, and you're like, ah, yeah, maybe I don't want to die of liver failure in my 40s. Maybe I don't want to do that. Yeah, maybe you don't. Hmm. Shooting for the CPA definitely gave me more direction as well. Um, so I would say the short answer to this in your example is unfortunately a majority of men will not of their own accord just say hey i'm gonna go train firearms and and go to the gym you know just of their own accord they're gonna need some sort of kick in the ass but i mean going something like going to the gym i don't think you need something as extreme as someone trying to rob you or something to, to make you feel like all right i need to go and train but i think for most people it's it's definitely not just this thing you acquire it's something that it comes to you via epiphany majority of the time. So uh, hopefully that answers your question, Fit Fingers. Next question, Eric Gare. Do you think that anyone should remain in the black pill space indefinitely, or do you think all black pills should be white pilled over time? Red pill isn't inherently nihilistic, so I don't see a need to transition them personally. Okay, we just went over this earlier. A lot of people fuck this up, and it's nothing against you or anyone that says it. One of the rules on my channel is this. Ideas, people. Black pill is just the idea. The nihilism is the person. Let me say that again. Black pill is the idea. Nihilism is the person. If black pill makes you feel like shit, that's normal. But you shouldn't feel that way forever. You need to process it as you would red pill and move on. So the short answer is I think people should become white-pilled over time in the sense that they have accepted it. Becoming white-pilled is just merely accepting the information. I am not angry about this anymore. 
I am not sad about this anymore. I have learned this information. But this information is not going to define the rest of my existence. I refuse to allow it to do so. So now on the other side of the now what question is the white pill. How am I going to live my life? Who am I going to look to to kind of get an idea? Where am I doing my soul searching? And this is why I do the ethics videos, right? How do you want to conduct yourself now that you know this shit? That's really what the meat and potatoes is. But a lot of people, again, especially in the red pill space, because they're normies. Normies don't have to take the black pill. So they look at the black pill and they're like, well, that's not my experience. Very much like how solipsistic women say in their little blue pill fairy tale end, well, that's not my experience. I don't know what the fuck you red pillers are talking about. Again, I've said this before. I cannot acknowledge Chad's privilege or women's privilege in blue pill fantasy land without also acknowledging my own in red pill land. Because right now there are sub fives in black pill land where, look, they lift weights and they do all this stuff and their face is still what it is. They are still short. These things are not a death sentence. I understand that. But just understand that there is a looks glass ceiling. And if you do not pass that looks glass ceiling, there is a price to pay. And most men do not have to pay this price. Therefore, most men are blissfully unaware of it, just as a majority of women are blissfully unaware of the psychological warfare that red pill covers right? Black pill is just a little bit more physical. And I think men are uncomfortable with it because it talks about things that men cannot control. But do we not embrace stoicism? Stoicism is the idea of accepting that which we cannot control and embracing what we can control and making it optimal. So nihilism, as I look at it, is just the person. I look at nihilism as a black pill depression, or nihilism can also sometimes just be a red pill depression. Turd Flinging Monkey talks about this, better off blue. Or when I talk about the black pill, better off red. Most normies are better off red. Chads are better off blue. They don't need to know this shit. Unless they're a chad that's being used for sex and they want a long-term relationship but can't get one. They're just the eggplant emoji and they want to be more. There are chads that are like that. Probably not common, but they're like that. So again, to answer your question, and also um, critique that last point, red and black pill, both are not inherently nihilistic. It is just information. Nihilism is just the response. It's just the response. And I would agree with you that being nihilistic is not productive because it leads to things like self-deletion, which we are trying to stop. But very much like red pill information, black pill information, you take that with you wherever you go. But the long term is to accept, aka become white pilled and find some sort of meaning in your life. Because box is not the center, right? So hopefully that answers your question, Eric. Next, Ethan Cruz. What's your favorite thing to do in New York City? Hmm. Well, you're talking to a guy who doesn't get invited to gatherings much. <laughs> What do I like to do in New York City? Well, I honestly think I'm pretty incompatible with urban lifestyle. Don't get me wrong. I like technology. It's one of my vices. I have my computers, my video games, and all that stuff. But if you're talking about going out there in the real world, mm, I kind of like nature in the sense like you'll, I'm the guy you'll find in parks, sitting on a park bench just looking out. That's the kind of stuff I like. Um, I like museums. Museums are cool. Um... I am a fan of Broadway shows, to be honest with you, but um, I don't go to them much. I did see Aladdin. I liked Aladdin. Um, I saw Phantom of the Opera. That was pretty good. Um, Rock of Ages. That was good. So I, I do, like, if you're talking, like, attractions in the city that I like, I would say Broadway is pretty attractive to me. Um, mm, other things I like to do that I guess the Five Boroughs has, um, I, used to, I used to do bowling a lot, but that was back when I was drinking. I would just drink and bowl. Um, I used to do karaoke a lot too. Uh, I like karaoke. Yeah. Don't ask me to sing. I'm not that great. Um, <laughs> but I did enjoy it. And when you're hammered, it's a little bit easier and you're less self-conscious. But I mean, most of the time when you're an adult, you're just kind of, you know, you're doing your nine to five. You're hanging out at home because when you're working your ass off, you tend to appreciate the downtime more, you know, 
But I guess that's probably the most that I do in New York. Though Long Island, that's not New York City, went to the range, and that, that was pretty fun. I had a good time. Next, KXNG underscore T. What your favorite superhero, and if you had superpowers, what would it be? And I love your channel. Well, thank you. My favorite superhero, Rorschach from Watchmen. He's probably my favorite DC superhero. Though, if we're talking villains, I am a Joker fan, of course. But Marvel, I would say probably Deadpool. So, those are the two main comic book giants, right? So, out of the two of them, I'd say Rorschach. I like Rorschach. Rorschach's very self-reflective. I was a big fan, like, reading the comic Rorschach's Journal. Yeah. I would say Rorschach is my favorite superhero. Now, if I could have any superpower I wanted... Any superpower I want, I probably want to. I probably want to fly, and I probably would want to be able to breathe in any type of environment. So I could just fly through outer space, and not worry about it. I could walk underwater; nothing happens to me. Um, that type of thing. Um, so yeah, that that's probably what I want. So I, I basically want to be Superman. Um, <laughs> but this would be a, actually a very useful superpower. <laughs> Not x-ray vision, but basically you'd be able to look at a girl, right? And you could like basically like scan her and have stats. And then right above, you can see how many men she had first base with, second base with, third base with, and home plate with. That would save you so much time, right? When screening for modesty. <laughs> but I would say my number one would be flying around and, um, and being able to breathe in any environment. Yeah. Um, but I always, it's funny because usually when you think about, well, if you have a genie and they give you three wishes, what would it be? Um, I might as well answer that question for you too. I tend to always kind of go, hmm, I don't know what I would want for the third wish, but the first two wishes would definitely be to be able to speak any language fluently and to be able to play any musical instrument. And I guess we would include singing in musical instruments because in a way your vocal cords is an instrument. That's probably what my wishes would be. Okay. Next, Hassan Maya. Being neurodivergent, how do you deal with people at the workplace? It really seems to grind my gears, and I use a stoic approach, good, but I'm craving at the idea of owning my own company and running it the way I'd like, which is expected of neurologically divergent people. They see things differently. Watch your thoughts on that. Thanks for all the videos and peace from the UK. Well, thank you, mate. <laughs> on the other side of the pond. That was Australian. Whatever. Fuck me, I'm ignorant, right? <laughs> I mean, listen, being neurologically divergent, you just you have to deal with the fact that people are going to give you weird looks when you open your mouth and talk. It's just the way it is because you're not talking about neurotypical things. You're not talking about squid games, you're not talking about sports, you're not talking about current events. You're you're talking about shit that most people just don't care about and they kind of give you these looks. So, I mean, I don't say you have to um, you have to filter yourself. I don't filter myself at all. When I speak, I speak with no filter. But sometimes you just kind of have to sit back and just listen to everybody around you. Um, because obviously when you're neurodivergent, you talk. Again, it's very hard to relate to people unless you're talking to another neurologically divergent person. And I always say this like with my childhood best friend, we can have deep conversations about things because we're both similar in psychological profile. But, um, yeah, when you're dealing with neurotypical people, again, you do have to kind of take that stoic approach where it's like, all right, this is something I can't really control, so I just kind of have to roll with the punches. Yeah. So, um, yeah, owning your own company definitely is good because then you can build your own company culture and decide kind of how you want to run things. So that's one way to deal with it. And then you can screen for people that are more neurologically compatible with you and have those people work with you so you can be a well-oiled machine within your company. I agree with that. Next, we have Mr. Shaw. I have a question, please. What are your thoughts on the compromise of men's spaces on the internet? In my humble opinion, the MGTOW, MGTOW, damn censorship, Spaces have been absolutely commandeered by what, in essence, blue pills and PUAs. Well, PUA is just another approach within the red pill space. 
but it's a very different approach from the MGTOW um, way of it, which is why they're kind of at odds with each other. I don't think either side, <laughs> shied, I don't think either side should be saying like, hey, my way is the objectively correct way to solve this problem of, hey, we have a clear decrease in marriageable women, so how are we going to approach women? Um, I think both are valid approaches. You just decide what works for you. But um, I have my observations on how this came to pass, but I'd like to hear yours. So again, if you want to corrupt, money is one of the best ways to do it, for sure. So I think if you're going to operate in this space and remain transparent, you can't be tempted by money. You have to kind of not even consider money. That's why I always say openly, like, do not send me money, nothing like that. I don't want it. Because I think that's how you stay on point and stick to your own ideas. Um, that being said, um, how it came to pass is there are a lot of men out here where they acknowledge the red pill for what it is, but they are not really red pilled as they are purple pilled in the sense that they're kind of on the fence. They understand why feminist ideals and things like this are kind of like, eh. But they don't quite lean into the MGTOW stuff on the other side either, right? They're kind of just in the middle where they're like, okay, I still want an LTR and things like this. And I myself have said on this channel, I'm open to LTRs and things like this. But I'm not interested in spinning plates. I'm not interested in paying money for a course to figure out how to charm my way into, into box. These things are, I look at it the same way I look at alcohol. Yes, yeah, when first starting out, getting girls casually, it's like, yeah, it's all pleasure and no pain. But eventually, it's like alcohol. You just you get addicted, and then it's like, all right, now what? That's just my take on it. But um, again, one thing you have to understand, Mr. Shaw, is that within the manosphere as, as a whole, it all exists. Okay, There's MGTOWs, there's MRAs, there's PUAs, there's incels and all this. It all exists together which is why i try to cover it all and you have to decide what resonates with you me personally i am not going to tell you what should work for you you decide everyone's different psychologically speaking they have to decide where they fit and how they decide they're going to deal with this information after they have accepted it that is on you so i wouldn't be so concerned with all these so-called infiltrators because you should trust your own judgment by this time to know like who's genuine and who's not, I would hope. So continue to exercise your skills in judgment of character, which is what we talk about a lot on this channel in terms of what ethics is and what values are and morals are, and um, make the right call. You kind of have to take responsibility in that regard, but... Again, are people who are just trying to capitalize financially on people's suffering? Yeah, it's, it's scummy shit. Um, and I think PUA information is the kind of information, ideally, if we are really interested in helping men, it should be given for free. That's what I think. All right, so hopefully that answers your question, Mr. Shaw. Next, we have Vagonius Thicket Suede. Please talk about boredom and how that affects the dating scene. Boredom experienced by both genders greatly influences dating dynamics. My own belief is that women who are bored are willing to date less attractive men to placate their boredom, and men who are bored skew the dating market because they spend all their free time on dating apps and are super try-hard when it comes to dating. So, when it comes to boredom, I mean, boredom is so easy nowadays because we have so much stimuli, outside stimuli around us, inputting all this stuff into our brains. I know it might be difficult, especially for the Zoomers to imagine, but imagine a world with no internet. Imagine a world with no cell phones. Imagine a world where the only way you really got mental stimulation was to go out into the real world and experience shit. It was definitely much easier to bond with other humans back then. But because we have technology and all this stuff just kind of inputting all this data into our brain at rapid rates, boredom in the real world is very easy to find <laughs> by comparison. Okay? So that's definitely something that um, you have to think about, the internet and its effect on boredom. Um, do I think women who are bored are willing to date less attractive men to placate their boredom? 
I think women are willing to use men in the context of the digital Superman. I guess if you call a foodie call a date, if you call the emotional tampon a date, if you call the mover handyman who helps her move her shit around the apartment a date, I guess, yes, they're willing to do that. While men are swiping on apps because, again, higher libido gap, they just they just want a higher libido and that creates the gap. That's why they, they do it because they, they just want to smash and, and that's really just what it is. So in desperation, because they don't have the information that you and I have, they don't realize what a pointless exercise it is. But I think, yes, because of technology, they try to look at dating the same way they look at anything else, like Uber Eats, Uber Lyft, and things like this. And of course, when you're dealing with other human beings, it's just not like that, and that's what causes the disconnect. Yeah. So boredom, I think, is just a natural byproduct of technology and how, how easy it's made the things that normally would intellectually engage us. And that's why our attention span is dropping and we're getting dumber and so on and so forth. So hopefully that is a sufficient take from your angle. Next, there are no shortcuts. Hmm. Can you do some videos on your thoughts on the current state of the economy? Not sure if this is your area, though. I would say it's not really my area, but it's obvious that the economy is having a rough patch. But if you look at the business cycle, it's ups and downs. There's recessions, there's expansions, there's there's peaks and troughs. Um, to be honest, I'm not really concerned about the economy um in the long term at least for now perhaps i should be it's a function of my ignorance for sure not fully understanding you know it's kind of like when you watch that um movie um the big short right where you got these guys who understand hey you're selling subprime mortgages to people who can't afford them and then you're packaging it into mbs and then the shit you fail to sell you're packaging that into cdo like, this is not sustainable. Hey, we need to get some credit default swaps to get an insurance policy on this so that when this shit blows up in our faces, we get a payout. And that's why AIG almost failed and shit like that, right? Most people don't intuitively understand that. And even my understanding is limited. But I would say overall, I don't have a negative outlook on where the economy is going. Um, I think one way or another, humanity will find a way to persevere. Um, whether or not that means that the current system is going to continue or if we're going to fail and then we're going to have a barter system, I cannot say. But I know that humanity will find a way to endure. And that's probably the most I can say on the topic. Next is Amir Pride. What's your thoughts on MGTOW? A valid philosophy. Simple as that. We have a society where men are moving like women, the simps, and women are moving like men. And as a result of this, we are having a mismatch at play. And a lot of men are just looking at this hyper-masculine, high body count, just sexually liberated, just ratchet shit. And ladies, if the shoe doesn't fit, don't take it personally. But men are seeing this all over TikTok and Instagram and things like this. And they're like, this is who I'm supposed to bring home and introduce to my mother? This? And they're saying, fuck it. They're looking at divorce courts and how men are getting treated. Men are getting treated like adults, but women are getting treated like children. And they're like, fuck it. I'm not dealing with this. So again, as a man, you have autonomy. You can check out of dating. You can check out of marriage. I see MGTOW as a completely viable and valid approach to dealing with this problem and focusing on yourself. And ladies, if you didn't want these men anyway, no need to get angry about it. You both win. But an incel would argue that if ladies didn't want him anyway, that's an M still. Men sent his own way. But I highly doubt the man who has consciously decided to go his own way gives a shit, whether he was sent that way involuntarily or if ultimately someone would have wanted him and he just chose to go anyway. Another question from Amir Pride. What's your thoughts on Coach Red Pill disappearance in Ukraine? Apparently a news called the Daily Beast doxed him before he went missing. Many suspect he'd be taken. Yeah, he was in Ukraine speaking from a pro-Russian perspective. What did you think was going to happen? There's nothing really else to say about it. Yell loud enough and eventually someone's going to come over and see what all the fuss is about. And that is what happened to him, I suspect. Or maybe some other shit happened and he just personally had to take care of some things. Who knows? But just understand that if he does not show up in the foreseeable future... Um, 
Yeah, that's probably what happened to him. Another question from Amir Pride. What are your thoughts on genetic editing or engineer a generation? Basically, eugenics. Um, do you think it will cure the black pill and lower women's standards since they now have 100% getting perfect baby? Well, here's the thing, right? If we had genetic editing where basically everybody's born a Chad or a Stacy, you have an entire population of just Chads and Stacys, let's say. The only thing then that would cause an issue is non-physical incompatibilities and the fact that maybe there is more of one sex than the other. Because if there is more of one sex than the other, which usually it's men, because men aren't out fighting wars like they used to, what ends up happening is that somebody's going to get the short end of the stick, and it would be the sex that has more numbers compared to the other. But do I think eugenics is inherently a bad thing? No. Um, but do I think it should be done in an ethical manner? Yes. But I don't think we're ever going to have a society of 100% Chads and Stacys. But the only issue would be non-physical incompatibilities and, um, whatchamacallit, numbers. That's what would affect the odds of some people. But um, a lot of people sleep on um, the neurological divergence. Neurological divergence can sink a ship just as effectively as sub-5 looks. Okay? And it looks like this is the last question from Amir Pride. Do you think society is on the verge of collapse due to mistreatment of men, high prices and gas prices, and more guys waking up? If you ask me, I doubt it. I agree. I don't think society is going anywhere, to be honest with you. It doesn't hurt to be prepared for hockey mask time, but I do not think hockey mask time is on the immediate horizon. Perhaps the mid to long term, but who knows what that means in terms of time frame. Some say five years, some say ten years, but there are people in the 70s saying shit was falling apart. We're still here. But hey, if that doesn't mean that um, they couldn't be proven right for a change either. So yeah, it doesn't hurt to be prepared. But I think what you're going to see is you're just going to see, again, what we're calling a post-marriage society. People aren't getting married anymore. People aren't having kids anymore. We're supplementing the decrease in babies popping out with immigration so that the people will do the jobs. So I would say... Um, at the end of the day, guys waking up just means we're going to have um, a reinforcement of the post-marital world, for sure. But I don't think and we're going anywhere anytime soon. Yeah. Next is Gallo Sengen. Thoughts on religion as a means to control hypergamy, monkey branching, and allow a purple-pilled man to take a more calculated risk with a marriage. Obviously, the female in question would have to be devout, but this particular constraint has panned out for me personally. Yeah, I did a video on this on the Red Pill playlist. Um, social norms and stigmas, they do regulate the Yoga Booga. It is a form of oofy doofy, social engineering. And I do think it was effective, um, but I think we are far past that now where honestly the things that would repulse the religious folk is going to become the norm, and there's nothing you can do about that. So I'd say um, trying to find a balance on the purple pill on the fence is probably not something i would recommend i consider that bargaining and i don't think you can bargain with reality uh, i did a i did a series that covers this um the steps going through to get to acceptance the road to acceptance is the name of the playlist i encourage you to check that out so i don't really think bargaining is viable so i think you should fully embrace red pill considering religion's very based i don't think it's really difficult um and then just kind of achieve acceptance from there now that being said you cannot control hypergamy and monkey branching in a society that actively tells women there's nothing wrong with it. I was even watching a video yesterday where Japanese women are cheating like insane. Like you would think like Japan, like reserved, conservative. Yeah, lots of cheating. So it's like this ideology, this sexually liberated ideology is going to continue to infect the shores all around. And then the monogamous model is just not going to exist, which is going to lead to a large swath of people just not getting laid. It is what it is. But, I mean, at the end of the day, there is no, again, carnation instant vetting. You have to do the work and vet. Because one of the running jokes and stereotypes is that some of the biggest freaks are in the churches. So again, 
you need to be mindful of that and just make sure you're actually dealing with a religiously devout woman and not a community bicycle that's just looking for forgiveness on Sunday after being at the club on Saturday. Yeah? So, yeah. But again, you're also talking to somebody who is atheist. That being said, though, I definitely see merits in faith. I see the value in faith and how it can offer guidelines, just as any other philosophical ethical code can offer guidelines. So having a woman who is devout probably will work to your advantage if you yourself are devout. But at the end of the day, even within your own religious community, vetting is a must. You have to. Hopefully that answers your question. Next is real names not given. What is your favorite video game? Mass Effect. Probably followed by Halo. And then probably Metal Gear is my third favorite series. And I would say Shin Megami Tensei is my fourth. Um, those are probably my top four. If I were to throw a fifth one on the end, I am a fan of Dragon Age as well. Same people who make Mass Effect make that. But Mass Effect's number one, for sure. Our Thinking Ape. Congratulations, Lord of Ireland and Scion of Dagda. On the successful completion of the task appointed to you by the gods, you have truly been blessed. Thank you. I'm just glad it's over, bro. And then you sent me a video of a bunch of Irish chicks talking about what they look for in men. I watched the video. I was very surprised at how well-spoken those women were. They just, again, they just had this sense of decorum that you just don't see in modern times. Again, it truly is a relic of a bygone era. It's, it's depressing to watch that and see what we have now compared to what is back then. So that was some depression fuel. Next. Steve from Texas. There's a new edition called Five Years of Freedom. From what I can tell, he is M. Still. Claims MGTOW, of course. Is this man coping or is he delusional? What's your opinion? So I checked out this guy's channel. Honestly, listen. The dude spits facts, okay? Be that as it may, though, whether or not he's M. Still or MGTOW is irrelevant because ultimately if he accepts that he's going his own way, the reason why he's going his own way, whether it's voluntary or otherwise, I mean, it doesn't really matter if ultimately he genuinely made the choice, okay? Now, that being said, life is cope. Life in its entirety is cope. And knowing that life in its entirety is cope uh, means that in some way or another, we're all coping with the existence between birth and death and the downtime between reproduction, which is our secondary objective as humans. But generally, again, the guy spits useful information, that's always good. Um, but whether or not he is coping or delusional, only he really knows that in his heart to hearts, whether he's bullshitting himself. Next. Kilo. I've been thinking about how much relationships have changed in the past 100 years after women's suffrage in 1920. What will relationships look like between men and women in the year 2120? Worse. More superficial than it already is. Speculation, welcome if you care to extrapolate based on current day trends. Um, I think women are probably going to be lifelong spinsters. Men are going to be lifelong bachelors. And what's going to happen is that um, there's going to be a small slice of the pie that engages in lots of casual sex on both sides. And most people are just going to focus on their own lives and not have sex. That's probably what's going to happen. Brutal. What's your take on the phrase I didn't ask you to? Met someone through a group of friends. We had a lot of things in common, and one of my guy friends said that I should go for it. Shoot you shot. I would invite her to group outings. It's more than I can say for myself. I don't get invited to gatherings. <laughs> We'd go to movies as a group, so it wasn't really a date. True. But I would offer to pay for her ticket or snacks when she said she couldn't go because of money. I would advise against that, but okay. Over time, it became normal to pay for her and didn't mind it. Exactly. When you do things, they start to expect it, so they have to earn it first. I thought I was doing the gentlemanly thing. Blue pill. She seemed grateful for it, and she smiled a lot. Maybe she was, maybe she wasn't. We're not mind readers. But you don't give something for nothing. One day, she was talking about wanting to see West Side Story. No one else wanted to see it because they thought it was corny. As I said, I like, I like Broadway. Nothing wrong with it. 
She looked so disappointed, so I offered to go with her. She seemed interested at first, but then said she'd think about it. I asked again the following week, then she said, sure. I was extremely excited because I was actually expecting to hear her say no. I got reserved tickets to dine in theater and then dropped by her workplace to tell her we were set for Friday night. She said she couldn't go because she was going to be busy. I tried getting a refund, but could only get partial <coughs> credit. So at this point, I would say, I would have said something like, I'm thinking about getting tickets to West Side Story. I'd like you to come with me. Would you like to go to West Side Story with me? And if she says yes, then I guess that would be her basically saying, like, I agree, I asked you to. But it doesn't sound like that was confirmed. It's okay. It is what it is. It's a cheap price to, to pay, honestly, to, to learn the mistake. There are much heavier prices men pay in divorce court, so better to learn this shit for a cheaper price. Um, yeah, a week later, I hear she saw the movie with the guy she actually wants to fuck. Yeah. I got upset because this wasn't the only time that this kind of thing has happened. But you now know that if she wanted to go with you, she would have gone with you. If she didn't go with you, she must not have wanted to go with you that badly, which means she doesn't find you attractive. It is what it is. When I tagged along with the group on a following week, she asked casually what was wrong. At first, I said it was nothing, but was so upset that I didn't care. And so I confessed that I was disappointed because I had gotten tickets, which I couldn't use, and how she ended up going to the movie anyway. So by doing this, um, you have weakened your position psychologically, and now she respects you even less. I'm just telling you this so that you know it. Her response was, well, I didn't ask you to. Very disrespectful response. But technically, she didn't ask you to. But it's like, bro, like, hey, would you go to West Side Story with me? I mean, it's kind of implied. But again, you have to, nowadays, especially as someone who argues on the internet all the time, you have to be so fucking pedantic. Because if you're not, the other side's going to be super pedantic and tear apart every fucking word you say. And that's what she's doing here. So, again, this is why you have to confirm shit. But I've been told variations of this before and was just sick of it. So anytime I feel like doing something nice and then get screwed over, I'm supposed to check whether that person asked me to? Unfortunately, yes. It seems that if someone asks you to do something nice, then it's not genuinely a nice thing to do. Again, it's how you position it. I would like to go to see West Side Story with you. I'm thinking of getting tickets. Would you like to go with me? Yes or no? If she says yes and then goes back on it, she's a scumbag. If she says no, you know where you stand. Women speak in choosing signals. You have to speak directly. It is what it is. I'm sorry. I didn't talk to anyone and eventually left early saying that I needed to wake up early in the morning. I didn't ask you to. feels like such a BS phrase to say. But technically, she didn't say, would you take me to West Side Story? So you have to initiate and say it. But I would say um, don't ever entertain this girl seriously as more than anything just like in the circle. Again, do not. There are consequences for being a bitch. Next, Barack Arslan in Mushoku Tensei anime. This man cheated on his wife, and then they made up, and then both women became a part of the family. I'd like to hear your thoughts on this. Here's the thing. This is a matter of high-value men, right? So a high-value man is a man who is obviously very successful, very well-off. He's got resources. Other men want to be him, and women want to fuck him, right? That's pretty cut and dry. All right? Now... If women have a willingness to share you, they are going to. It's as simple as that. Most men are not viewed by women as worth sharing. It is a privilege of a small, select group of men. But I honestly think just like there's more money, more problems, more women, more problems. <laughs> if you thought one woman was a handful, try being a Muslim man with four wives. Give that a go. <laughs> One is enough for most, but I would say, um, again, the reason in this anime why the wife decided to squash the beef is that the cost of losing the husband outweighed the benefits of challenging her husband on this. And ultimately, maybe hand in hand with that, a secondary reason is that she respects her husband. And when you respect someone, you might be more inclined to do things like this. But most people are happy to just be in a monogamous relationship with one person. But there are these certain arrangements um, where you know you get to, you have to share the man, and it's closed off on your side. You think LeBron James only bangs his wife? You don't think he bangs other girls? 
Exactly. What you see on the face and what happens behind closed doors are very rarely the same thing. Okay. Next question is by Thinking Ape. Here is a question. If you were porn free and everything else were on point, would you bother dating? Probably. Yeah, porn is the number one reason I don't date. But the paradox is that I can't find a reason to quit other than pussy. So what that does is it puts you in a position where it's like it's just a, it's just a vicious cycle. Just like alcohol where you have to find a reason to quit for yourself, you have to find a reason to quit porn for yourself. But I can't think of one other than getting box. Hence the crisis of motivation. But obviously, if I did not watch porn, my libido would be a lot higher, which of course women would then look even more attractive to me than they already do, and then I'd be more inclined to approach them. Yes. And I wouldn't have to worry about performance issues either because my brain's dopamine levels would go back down to a level and then I'd have no issues as a 32-year-old man. But I think, honestly, you would still have to go in with absolute caution, think with your big head, and so on and so forth. But to answer the question very directly, if I was porn free, would I be more open to dating? Yes. For sure. I think realistically what's going to happen is if I meet a girl that I think is a good prospect, I'll probably start weaning off the porn without her knowing, and then by the time we get to the main event, I'll have no issues. That's, that's usually how it goes. Next. Feral Android. I seem to get more motivated when I am pursuing a relationship with a woman. I don't really want one with modern women, though. I don't blame you. I've been playing with the idea of creating my unicorn on paper and then using that as motivation. Knowing I'll almost certainly never have a relationship with her, maybe it's similar to using the myth of heaven as motivation to do good in life. So here's the thing, right? The unicorn on paper is hope. And it's okay to have hope. I have no issue with it. Doing all these things on the off chance that maybe you find your unicorn. I don't think it's the best reason to do it. Again, I just answered Thinking Ape's question about porn. You have to do it for yourself. That's the only thing that's for sure going to keep you on the straight and narrow. But at the end of the day, I always say do not make box the center. You should not be doing things for women. That's not why you should be doing it. Having a unicorn, if you want to call it that, is a byproduct of working on yourself. So you really have to find a reason to want to do these things for yourself. And I know that's hard to do. Believe me, I know. But do you think this is wise or would it be better to try to stop myself from being motivated by an ideal relationship? Again, when you have a relationship and it's, you're really deep in, you have a family and things like that, okay, you have skin in the game. It makes sense. But just some random girl or just like some ideal you have in your head, again, you have to be able to perfect yourself and stand on your own, on your own merits, I would say. So I don't think it's the best idea, but having a hope in your head, like nobody's gonna judge you for that, man. You're biologically wired to wanna have companionship with a woman in some capacity or some sort of connection with women. But I would say in short, it's better to do things for yourself then do it for some ideal image in your head. All right, next we have Gengar J. Imagine being an adorable ghost like me. Gengar! <laughs> Whom would you haunt? I would not haunt anybody. I think what I would do is I would just go around where all the elites hang out and shit, and I would just quietly walk around and just see what these psychopaths actually get up to. <laughs> like, what's going on in the war room with Putin right now? <laughs> That's probably what I would do. Last but not least, Ice Cat 7. Oh yeah, I think you were the guy that shared my Oofy Doofy video, right? I think because of you, some subs came my way. So thanks for doing that, by the way. Um, hey, Pete, I'd love to hear your opinion on the Johnny Depp and Amber Heard situation. Oh boy. So for those of you who don't know, Johnny Depp was accused by Amber Heard of um, domestic violence and abuse towards her, when in reality, it was actually her that was physically abusing him. Amber Heard continued to get to do her movie roles and all that shit. Nobody held her accountable because the law treats women like children. But Johnny Depp, where he was innocent, he got held accountable for things he did not do. He lost his roles in movies. He lost money. He lost income. He was effectively cut off from his income, which by definition is canceling, right? And now he's suing her for defamation. He has recorded um, recordings of her saying things like, I'm the woman, you're the man. Who do you think they're going to believe? Shit like this. 
just the pure arrogance of a young woman who's physically attractive. She believes that, again, the law is going to take her side just because she's a woman. So what do I think about it? I mean, it's fucked up. But ladies who hear these types of stories, yes, you think it's disgraceful and horrifying that men have to go through this, especially when it's a quote-unquote hot guy like Johnny Depp that you find attractive, of course, which is a black pill right there. But if you truly believe these things, then I encourage you to join the MRA movement and fight right alongside them. And there are women who do, and they have my utmost respect. If you really, really want to, or maybe form a channel and start speaking on these things right alongside us, help us out, you know? I always say this too, um, in the back in the potato collection, I said, why happily married women need to speak up? You're happily married. You have what men want, and men have what you want, and you understand what a man needs to keep him happy, and what men care about, and what's acceptable and what's unacceptable. Share this information. Help the girls out. You know? And uh, I think that's pretty much what I have to say about that Amber Heard situation. In short, yeah, she's a bitch. What do you expect? And I feel really bad for Johnny Depp. But these types of stories are dime a dozen. And it's absolutely sad that it's becoming a common occurrence and that people think this should just be, you know, it's just a Tuesday. These types of things should rarely, if ideally, never happen. And I believe that is all the questions for this Q&A. So thank you so much for dropping your questions. I really appreciate it. Hope you enjoyed the Q&A. Uh, this is going to be my first time uploading a video using my Mac, so hopefully everything goes off without a hitch. But um, feel free to leave a like. Feel free to leave a dislike. Call me an asshole if you like. Uh, whatever you do, don't report the video. It's good information and it helps somebody. If you like what you're hearing, go ahead and hit that sub button. Um, if not, you can unsub. It's all good. I don't take it personally. As long as you get your info somewhere, fine by me. These Q&As in particular, I do these once a month. So at the end of next month, like probably like the last or third week or so, I'm probably going to do another one. So feel free to stay tuned for that community post and leave your questions that time as well. At the end of the day... It's stories like Johnny Depp and things like this that we have to talk about because it tells men that, no, you're not crazy. It's not just you. Uh, yes, a girl may have broken your heart, but it's no reason to self-delete. Find reasons to keep going for yourself on your own and you know, become the best you can be for you and nobody else. That's what we're here to help you do and get you out of that nihilistic valley. And also, ladies, if you're watching, right, I hope you're gaining some insight into the male perspective. Because we want to help you too. Again, we want men to be better, of course. But we want women to be better as well. Because if both of us are doing our best and becoming better, it builds goodwill and then dating gets better. But I don't think it's something that's going to happen like that. It's something that we really have to work at collectively as a society. And hopefully we do exactly that. As always, I am that guy, Pete, that you refuse to invite to gatherings. I'll definitely catch it for the next one. But for now, I'm going to head on out. Take care.